So are you, is your name Chase Will or is it Will Chase? Oh, it's Chase Will. I actually get that all the time. <laughs> oh, that you do. Okay, yep. sorry. My parents did not know what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to... Critique Family, Family Fun Nights. Hello, everybody. My name is Lucas Liner. I'm Chase Will. And I'm Christy Phil. And this is the Crip Tease Family Fun Night, our film discussion podcast, right here on the Crip Tease Podcast Network. Joining us today, this one is one that's very near and dear to my heart. She is a professor at Bowling Green State University in the German department. She's an expert on the director of our film, to Golden Glove, that is Fatih Akin. She is my mentor from my grad. Like, I kind of don't know where I'd be without her. Dr. Christy Fell, welcome, <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Lucas. You are, you are too kind. Um, I will tell you, so when I saw that it said family fun night on this, I thought, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Not a oh, this was, this was definitely a family movie. Oh, for sure. <laughs> there um, were <laughs> gatherings, there, there, were, there were, you know, songs. There is lots of family. <laughs> but um, not the good kind. Oh, no. <laughs> and this is actually the first movie of Fatih Kins that has an 18 and over rating wow. in Ooh. Germany, which would kind of be equivalent to our R rating. He, he does keep it short of the X rating because the sex scenes, while you could call them explicit, I mean, it's very clear what's going on. Um, there's no full frontal the violence scenes although there's lots of violence and lots of gore um it's not a snuff film right, right. no people were actually harmed in uh the making of this movie i thought it was really tasteful so, too the way like you would see him what he was doing but it would be really heavily insinuated and you would see him like carrying these packages toward the crawl space but you knew what it was it was super effective yeah absolutely so it's kind of if I can, just one second, um, since we haven't said it yet, we're talking about the Golden Glove today. Or I don't know if I said that. Oh, shit. I don't know. I'm I'll not put a source. Sure it's in the title. <laughs> yeah, it's in the title. 2019 film. Um, it was nominated for some awards, but it was critically panned. I saw and, that. Yeah, I really haven't found... Um, very many good reviews of it at all, especially from the professional critics. And I have a theory about why that is. I mean, Lucas knows that I personally am not a fan of the horror genre. And uh, because I just can't take being, you know, I have nightmares. Um, this film didn't actually give me nightmares, although maybe it should have. And I don't really think it's a horror movie even though it's described that way, I think that it is a serial killer movie. And that's something that I actually am sort of into. So I think I've watched all but the, the last season of Criminal Minds because I can't find any place to watch it for free, right? Um, but I would say that this, um, one of the reasons that this movie was panned is that it doesn't do what Criminal Minds does. And that's a good thing, I would say. In Criminal Minds, it's always about figuring out, you know, what deep trauma in the um, in the perp's background has led him to whatever totally bizarre thing he's doing. And in Criminal Minds, most of the criminals are actually very intelligent and they play mind games. If you think about this, it's just a trope of almost any crime or murder show that, yeah. um, you know, think Silence of the Lambs, how he mm -hmm. plays with Clarice, and you always have like the showdown where the criminal explains why he had to do something. You never ever get that in this movie. And this is what the critics couldn't stand. The critics said things like, there's no depth to it. There's no um, psychological explanation. Yeah, because this criminal is not attractive. He's not a mastermind. He's stupid. He's so stupid that uh, the way he gets caught is, and this is true, by the way, this whole thing is based on a real 
a thing that happened in Germany in the 70s, which was then uh, made into a novel by Heinz Strunk, and so the movie then draws on both the novel and the real events. Well, it truly happened that because this guy was preying on prostitutes, homeless women, alcoholics, people that nobody missed after he killed them, frankly. Um, and if they were missed, not a lot of effort was put into finding them. So, you know, even though the neighbors were complaining about the smell from his apartment, um, this is the one place where Fatih Keen actually draws on his usual topic, which is foreigners in Germany. Anytime anybody complains about the smell in his apartment, he says, oh, it's those damn foreigners, it's those Greeks downstairs. They're always cooking some weird shit, right? <laughs> And, and people buy this, right? It, it, people can't distinguish between the smell of rotting corpses and Greek cooking. I mean, that tells you all you need to know about the acceptance of foreigners. That so, actually made me wonder, too, because I haven't had a whole lot of Greek food in my life, but does it smell like rotting corpses? I, no, Greek I, food I, is delicious, <laughs> right? But it, it you is- You can ask about the taste, ask about the smell. <laughs> but, but it is this trope, and you know, you can think of it even in this country, um, I believe some people of the Hmong ethnicity have certain customs that call for sacrificing pigs, for example. And sometimes people will do this, say, in their bathtub, at home. And this kind of thing then sort of creates a bad name for foreigners so that, you know, people will believe any kind of nonsense as long as you can note it with, oh, those stupid foreigners, right? So the way that Fritz Honka is finally caught is that his house catches on fire. We don't really know why. Um, he's standing outside watching, and he stands there watching even when the policeman goes inside, comes out, vomits because of what he has found. And Fritz is so dumb that he doesn't even start to run away until he sees the police approaching him. Oh, yeah. This is not a mastermind. Now, where I would disagree with the critics, though, is when they say, well, there's no explanation given. There's plenty of explanation given. I noticed that, too. Because like, yeah. I noticed all of his victims were in some way smaller than him and had, it seemed like they were dealing with way worse than he was, and that's why he victimized them, it seemed like, because he could. Like, he was able to push them around so much easier than the guys in the bar, the guys who were physically more imposing, I, I, am I mistaken, or were none of his victims ever male? No, he's got no no male victims. It's always women. And it tends to be because they've either ridiculed him or refused sex. So if I think about the first victim we never really meet, she's already a corpse when, when, when we encounter her. Um, the second victim um, is a woman he brings home from the bar. I mean, this one is really quite incredible. He's sitting at the bar with three women. He's telling them in the most explicit terms what he wants to do to them. And then they all follow him home like, you know, ducklings on parade, all three of them. One of them faints on the way and he leaves her lying in the street. Um, the second one, she kind of catches on that things are not going to go well here, and she says she needs to go to the bathroom and gets away. The third woman is um, resisting going into the bedroom to do whatever she wants, and so he just smashes her head on the table. And the film shows that, of course. Now, to Ooh, me, yeah. this is horrific, but it's not a horror film in the sense that there was necessarily any suspense leading up to this. Although we maybe get that sense of don't go with him, you know, don't go home with this guy, right? Don't go into that room. Um, now, there is a woman before this who it almost seems like it's working out as a quasi relationship, although I really would not go so far as to call it a relationship. She's brought, he's yeah, brought her was... up one night right? This is um, Gerda is her name. So mm -hmm. she's a homeless woman. She's got all the look of someone who's been living outdoors, you know, it, what exposure does to your skin. She's, so none of these women are 
attractive in any conventional sense. They don't necessarily get our sympathy, except to the extent that none of them deserves to be killed, right? right. I mean, they, they deserve to at least continue living their miserable lives. And um, Gerda, he tells her, I want you gone when I get home, right? This is after he's brought her home and they've had sex. And he, by the way, this is one part of his issue. He seems to really be dealing with impotence. I believe he grabs a shoehorn in order to make things work, right? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't, I didn't go back and rewind it to see whether it was actually a shoehorn, but he grabs some type of implement. And at first I'm thinking, oh my God, what's he gonna do to her? But then it really seems as though he uses whatever it is to shoehorn his limp biscuit. <laughs> uh, Best limp biscuit callback yet. Lucas, uh, it's the second time we mentioned shit. that band. Yeah. Last it's always episode, we had a limp biscuit reference. That's always awesome. either Twilight or limp biscuit on the show. <laughs> it, it really is. It's kind of a shame oh, how well. we've gotten to that point. Yeah. So, um, I also, um, also I want to notice too that when he walks, he walks very much forehead first. Yeah. And I think that's like a trait of somebody with psychological issues or a drunk. Is that, am I right on either count? And he's both. He's both. Um, I don't know. There's at a certain point, um, he gets hit by a van. I mean, it just comes out of nowhere. It's totally unmotivated. He's walking down the street, van, boom. Just boom. Yeah. Um, that was kind of funny. And, and, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Funny, but it's also like it's totally unmotivated. And then you notice it happens right in front of a church, and there's a nun who immediately runs out to rescue him. So here's another theme um, of the film. There's a, a slight religion theme going on here. And it's very interesting because there's another theme where, or a scene, where a Salvation Army woman in full uniform, right? That's, who that, that's what that was. I'm like, yeah. she's talking about she's you know speak you know speaking like god and i'm like i i i, I didn't clock that at first i just thought she was yeah. like some i in my notes i had her as a missionary so. yeah she, well she is a missionary because that's part okay. of what salvation army does and she's come into this bar to you know help the down and out and first she goes to that table of three women and one of them tells her this horrible story about being molested by nuns. It's in grim detail, all right? Um, so it, and so it's an interesting, you know, we get this story, which we've got no reason to doubt, particularly given all the uh, church abuse scandal that's been in the news for, what, a good decade now. So we get this horrible story of nuns abusing uh, the young girl. But we then actually see a nun running out to help him. And when the Salvation Army woman realizes that she's just not welcome at this table, she goes over to Gerda's table. Now, Gerda is actually in fear for her life at this moment, and she's rescued by the Salvation Army. Um, the Salvation Army woman doesn't know what's going on with Gerda, but she says, look, I can take you and give you a, a nice place, to, a warm bed for the night, we'll feed you, and so Gerda uh, goes along with her. So there's, a, there's really kind of a nice, um, I don't know, if there's any sort of message about religion here, it's a good old fashioned, show me with your deeds and not with your words. And so we get the, the horror story about sexual abuse, but then we also see the nun running to help and the Salvation Army woman literally saving Gerda's life. Because here's what else is going, going on with Gerda. Um, so Fritz has told her, be gone when I get home. And instead, she starts playing wifey, right? She cleans up the apartment. That was such a weird scene. Yeah, we see her vacuum yeah. He comes home and he's like, hey, you cleaned. Can you cook too? And so now we're seeing almost a Marxist analysis here that this is an exchange transaction. And it frankly reminds me a lot of the director I saw a lot of in this film, which is Fassbinder, right? Uh, Reiner yeah. Fassbinder, the enfant terrible of the new German cinema the German director that, you know, if you've heard of any German directors and it's not like Caligari and the Weimar era, 
uh, things, it would be Fassbinder. And um, if you bear with me here, uh, I could do a screen share and um, pull up a clip that uh, will kind of give you a sense of what I'm uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, do Full I have screen it. And this is from uh, Fassbinder's The Marriage of Maria Brown. Genau wissen, um wen es mir geht, um Sie oder um meinen Chef? Bon, c'est un point de vue que je respecte. Ich würde gerne über mein Gehalt sprechen. Was haben Sie sich vorgestellt? Ich muss in den kommenden Jahren sehr viel verdienen. Ja, das wollen wir alle. Aber ich habe einen Grund, Herr Oswald. Also? Ich glaube, dass Sie mittlerweile einschätzen können, was meine Arbeit Ihnen wert ist. Und genau das will ich nicht mehr. Ich muss also darüber nachdenken, was Sie mir wert sind. Richtig. Meine Arbeit. Ja, richtig. Ihre Arbeit, Frau. Ich bin ein alter Mann und lerne deshalb etwas langsam. Aber ich werde mir Mühe geben. Yeah. Okay. So in this scene, what we see Maria Brown doing, and of course the whole film is full of scenes that point out how romantic and sexual relationships are really just chits in a game that everybody is playing. And Maria Brown at this point, even though we've seen her uh, kind of seduce her way into this job, she says, no, I don't want you to pay me what I'm worth, not based on our relationship. I want you to pay me what my work is worth. And so here, uh, Fassbinder really is inviting a Marxist analysis of labor and the value of labor. And I see that in this relationship with Gerda, where Fritz suddenly realizes, wait, she cleans and she cooks? Well, maybe I could keep her around. Yeah. And then, of course, the clincher is when he figures out that she has a daughter, right? Somebody <laughs> uh, presumably young and attractive. And then, uh, as, as though to kind of cement this whole line of thinking, there is a scene in which he brings home, he writes up a contract. Inspiration, holy it, shit. Right? I mean, it's like, I mean, in some ways, if you're going to cohabit with somebody, it's not a bad idea to have a, a few understandings in writing, you know, about who pays for what and so forth. But what he has her sign starts out with, um, I hereby affirm that I've never had it better anywhere than I have that was so with Tonka, right? So this is the best situation I've ever had in my life. And in exchange for this, I solemnly swear that I'm going to bring my daughter Rosie over to meet him so that he can get a piece of her. Uh, that I mean, scene was the most cringe worthy so, ever seen. Yeah. This is some shit I would have expected for a movie like that took place maybe a couple hundred years before this one did. This feels like yeah. it's a fucking dowry is what it is. Uh, yeah, something like that. But then the, the amazing thing is she signs it. And what this kind of shows me is that this woman is really not all there. She has the domestic skills that she gained over the years, but she's so far gone with alcohol that she's pretty much like, yeah, whatever. So she signs this thing. And the scene that we mentioned where she finally goes home with the Salvation Army woman, um, this is one that if my cursor were working, I would love to share with you. Um, so maybe I can follow up with some of those later. Um, but they're at the bar and suddenly he learns that Rosie, the daughter, is in Vienna, not in Hamburg. And he's so angry that he grabs his glass so hard that he breaks it and he starts bleeding. And, and and then he says to her, just you wait. So at this point, if you want to view it as a horror movie, this is the point where you're thinking, don't go back home with him, Gerda. Don't go back home with him because he's going to bash your head in. You know, you're going to end up as a corpse in the wall. And so Gerda then is saved by the Salvation Army. Now, we have no idea whether her soul is saved. You know, she clearly has no interest in talking about God and tries to uh, blow the woman off. But when she's offered a bed for the night, this is a way to get away from Fritz. And so Gerda 
survives, right? So the other thing I want to point out about this movie, um, this is a Fatih Akin movie, and Fatih Akin first hit the international scene with a film called Head On, which is a transnational movie. It starts out in Hamburg, which is his hometown, right? Fatih Akin was born to Turkish immigrant parents, but he himself was born and raised in Hamburg. So, I mean, I consider him a native German. Certainly his, um, the language that he speaks as a native is German and Hamburg is his hometown. Um, but Head On is a story that played in the Turkish immigrant community in Hamburg and that at a certain point shifts the action to Istanbul. So he made a series of, uh, well, sorry, I'm, I'm a series of three movies, um, all of which end up in Turkey at some point. The second one is Edge of Heaven, uh, which also goes back and forth between Hamburg and Istanbul. Um, and then the third one, uh, I'm blanking on the title right now, but it's the one about the Armenian genocide. Um, so that's a historical movie. The Cut? Uh, yes, thank you. The Cut uh, starts out in Turkey. Germany is only involved tangentially, and it's a historical film. But so this is what Fatih Akin really was known for, was exploring the immigrant condition and um, Turkish-German relations. And so even with the cut, um, when you draw in the Armenian genocide and the history there, there is some aspect of Turkish-German relations. Since the cut, Fatih Akin has really been making Hamburg movies. And my theory um, is that this is for two reasons. One is that he did what he set out to do in terms of exploring his Turkish ancestry, his Turkish roots. He's got a series of documentaries that are set in Turkey as well. And so I think he had a phase of simply exploring his heritage. And now that's done. And um, I can't swear to this, but I think he might have a kid in high school at this point. So he wants to stay close to home. And so all of his recent films are set in Germany and uh, like this one in Hamburg, this must have been in some ways a really, really easy film to make. And with that, I don't mean to um, denigrate his artistry or the effort that went into it, but we've really only got um, a couple of scenes. We've got Fritz's apartment, which is based on historical pictures, and I'll, I'll send you some of those. It matches up very, very closely. Um, I mean, it's, it is a horror movie setting, right? Oh, it's yeah. tiny. It's oh, yeah. It's a shithole. But like when I saw the yeah. pictures on the walls and the weird, creepy dolls, I'm like, any sane person would turn around right then. That is like a yeah. red flag I'm, on the field. I'm not sticking around to drink coffee there, let alone alcohol. <laughs> I wouldn't even put my right? feet on that floor. <laughs> no, it's, it's gross. And there's the one scene. Don't take a black light to that shit either. I mean. Oh, my gosh. No, there's the scene where Gerda goes into the bathroom, and that's really disgusting. Oof. So, yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got his apartment. We've got the bar, um, which is wonderful. If you know Fatih Akin, he uses the bar to have a bunch of people who are important to him play cameos. So you've got all these weird characters in the bar. There's the tampon guy. I mean, we only see him for like 10 seconds, but he, his thing seems to be dunking tampons in his drink and drinking it that way. It's just totally gross. Um, the author, Heinz Strunk. Uh, I did see that. Yeah, he uh, plays a character who's got all sorts of, you know, wise insights to deliver. Was well, he the and, guy with one eye? Uh, no, he's not the one-eyed guy, I don't think. At least that's not how the credits were. Um, although there is also a, a veteran who's also mega creepy. Um, and then there's Hark Bohm. Hark Bohm uh, made a film that again, I'm just, I'm blanking on titles, but it, it's a, it was sort of a buddy film from the 70s. So from the era 
that's being portrayed in this film, right? This film is set in the 1970s. And Hark Bohm, the director of a 70s film that uh, had major influence on Fatih Akin, he reaches out to him and says, hey, why don't you come be one of the barflies in my movie? So this bar with the creepy guys and the, you know, used up women, um, this is, I, I don't, I do not actually know whether they shot in the bar, but I think they did. I mean, I think they, um, because the owner of the bar knew about this story. And so this whole film shoot, like most of Fatih Akin's films, um, it turns out being a fam, sort of a family affair where he has his buddies playing roles. So Lefteris, the Greek guy in the apartment below, He's played by Adam Bostokos, who's in most of Fatih Akin's films, and he is Greek. Um, soul they, Kitchen, man. Fucking Soul yeah, Kitchen. Yes, exactly. He plays a wonderful um, role in that movie, but he even has a little cameo in the cut where he's a priest uh, who's just sort of out of his mind uh, chanting on the long road of the, the Armenian... Um, people as they're being taken away from their homes. So Adam Bostokos, it turns out that there was actually a Greek family that lived beneath this guy. And it was Adam Bostokos's godfather. And so- Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> all of the people involved in this film actually had some sort of connection to the original events. And the Golden Six Gun. degrees of Fritonka. That's a scary game to play. Yeah, <laughs> it's really creepy. And you know, when I saw the title, The Golden Glove, I was somehow expecting like a boxing glove. I was expecting like that. Which there of... are boxing movies called Golden Glove. When I when I shit oh, on I Amazon Prime, there were others like, like, nope, not that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you look at the German title, I, well, actually, no, I might be wrong about this. Yeah, the German title is just The Golden Glove, but the name of the bar is Zur Goldenen Handschuh. So like at the sign of the Golden Glove, which is a very typical German bar name, right? At the sign of the goose or, you know, whatever. And if you watch the trailer for the movie, I couldn't find one with English subtitles. Um, but when I first watched the trailer, you see a young man and a young woman standing outside the bar saying, really, should we go in there? And the guy says, yeah, normal people go in there too. I literally thought they were talking about going into the movie. Okay, because of the <laughs> way that they say it. I can see go, that reading. <laughs> should, should we go to the Golden Glove? Well, yeah, normal people can go in here too. And, you know, if you read it as the movie, the message is basically Fatih Akin's message. The director himself says, I can't recommend this film to anyone. I would not recommend that anybody watch this movie. I mean, that's literally what he says about his own film. And so, you know, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, you know, who would be interested in this movie? And what I came up with two classes of, of people, either really, really sick puppies, okay? And, I, and there was one review online, just like a user review, where some guy wrote, you know, I love serial killer movies and wow, this was the best one I've ever seen. And it kind of made me wonder what that guy was getting out of serial killer movies. I think he got the <laughs> wrong message from the movie. Yeah, you know, because this one is, is just so explicit. Um, but the second group of people who I think could be very interested in this film would be cinephiles, you know, people who really love film and who are interested in these things like that, that you noticed already, Chase, about, say, how he does show Fritz sawing off a woman's head, but it's staged in such a way that her head is behind the door of a cabinet. Um, I ended up wondering what on earth did they use to get such a realistic, or I assume realistic, I've never actually heard the sound <laughs> of the human head being sawed off, right? But it was, it like, was 
I assume realistic <laughs> enough, you know, you got the, you could tell that there was some effort. There's like the sort of some blood vessels exploding and like grating against bone. And I'm oh, he's like, breaking a sweat. You know, like, like, what was this? Was this like a pumpkin with a two by four inside it? Like, what did he use for this? Um, I don't know, but I would really love to know. Like, there's so many people behind the scenes I feel like should definitely have gotten awards if they didn't. Like the, the Foley yeah. artist for one who did those sounds, amazing, because it was so disgusting in all the right ways. And, and the also, other um, thing I that- a, Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the other thing that I would point out about framing that again, for me, recalls Fassbinder, um, I will send you a clip um, or no, actually, I think I have a still of this one, but it's another Fassbinder movie, very famous one called Ali Fear Eats the Soul, in which you have a, a love affair between a young immigrant and a woman in her 50s. Um, now that I am a woman in my 50s, I can really kind of relate to this, but she looks a lot like the victims in this movie, except that she's not as far gone. She's just older. And in Ali Fear Eats the Soul, Fassbinder repeatedly shoots scenes through door frames. And it gives you a sense of Brechtian alienation. And for Fassbinder, because he was a Brechtian theater guy, you know that that's what he's going for. In Fatih Akin's case, every sex scene that we see in this movie is shot through the doorway of that horrid little bedroom. Um, I th there might be one oral scene that's actually shot in the bedroom, but most of it, you know, if he's trying to have vanilla sex, these are all shot through the door. So what you're seeing is a lot of door, a lot of the porno pictures, um, you know, on his wall, and then you see his butt doing or trying to do whatever he's attempting to do. And it totally reminded me of Fassbinder and uh, Ali Firi's The Soul and the use of this framing device to show the alienation. Now, um, of course, Fatih Akin is also using it in another way. He's using it to avoid the X rating, right? So if you're only showing him from behind, um, then you know you can still get away with the R rating or in Germany the 18 plus instead of a full out um, X rating. But man, that the first scene of this film is exactly such a scene. It's shot through that doorway. We've got a lot of room, and then the action is just in this tiny, you know, door frame space. And he is doing something with a woman on the bed. And when I first saw it, I thought I was witnessing a rape. You know, I thought that he was yeah. to, you know, that she was asleep or drugged or gosh, is she maybe dead? And he's somehow trying to have his way with her. And then as the scene goes on, and at the latest when he pulls out the big plastic sheeting, right? They're like, oh, this is not a sex scene. This is a corpse disposal scene. And that right there sets the tone um, of the whole movie, right? Um, and then you also get an explanation for why is he just burying these parts in his, um, you know, why is he like sawing these women up in his apartment? Because you see him trying to drag this entire corpse down the stairs I don't know what he's going to do with it. He thinks he's going to just throw it in the dumpster or, or what? And one of the neighbors, a little girl, sees him. And at that point, he drags her back upstairs. We get that wonderful, awful sawing sequence. And, and he goes and he throws the body parts around the neighborhood. Ew. Now, this actually happened. And the parts were identified, uh, but there was never any headway made on finding the murderer. And after that initial, you know, sort of failed half attempt at corpse disposal, um, and you see it in the newspapers, right? And, and they even know the last time she was seen was at the Golden Glove. And then the title comes up. It takes almost 11 minutes to get the title uh, frame for this movie, which is actually sort of a typical uh, Fatih Akin thing as well.
I also noticed yeah. too. Um, go ahead, Lucas. No, you're good. I noticed that uh, the guy who played the killer, he is not an ugly man in real life. He's actually very charming looking, and he was only like 21 or 22. And I did not. I had to double check that fact over and over again. I'm like, there is no way that's a kid playing that role. Yep. They that was so crazy. Massive, massive makeup on him. And, you know, in real life, after he was hit by the uh, van, he got even uglier, right? Ugh. Now, personally, I didn't notice because he's already ugly enough at the start of the film. But um, biographically, historically speaking, yeah, he needed to have some reconstructive surgery and he just, he had a squint. I think the hunch gets more pronounced after that mm -hmm. as well. So the hunch um, could indicate his psychological problems, but it can also be the result of just these injuries from this accident. Um, but let's talk about his background a little bit. There is a scene in the film where his brother comes over while he's still living with Gerda. And within about 90 seconds, you get a really wonderful insight into at least one reason this guy is so screwed up. Um, he was born into a family of 10 kids. The brother says, yeah, my mother really couldn't deal with all the kids. And so it seems as though they were abandoned, went into foster care. They don't even know where the rest of their siblings are. And the brother tells us, oh, I'm the only one that Fritz is still in touch with. Gerd asks, well, what happened to the rest of them? He's like, well, this one died. This one lives in Leipzig. Just, okay, and the rest of them, because there were 10, right? And we've only accounted for four. I don't know, disappeared, died. This is not a healthy family background, right? So we don't get a lot of detail, but I think just that little factoid and the fact that the family, you know, they didn't even like each other enough to try and look each other up later. So that's a little bit of insight. Then much, much later in the movie, it's the second to last victim, my favorite, actually, because this is the woman who fights back. Oh, yeah. Right? She and kicks his ass. Oh, awesome for a while. Not only that, but so, but, but here's the weird thing about this. They're in the bar, right? And he notices a scar on her forearm. And, uh, you know, where'd you get that? And she says, I was forced into prostitution in a concentration camp. Well, the, the forearm, this would be where concentration camp inmates had their number tattooed. She never tells us why she was in the concentration camp, but this is a thing that happened, that uh, the younger, more attractive women, whether they were there for being Jewish, communist, um, lesbian even, it did not matter to the Nazis, uh, they would uh, put the younger women into brothels for the SS officers and so forth. And, you know, the women, first of all, did not really have a choice in the matter, but uh, second of all, you got better food, right, because they wanted their prostitutes healthy with meat on their bones. And so, um, again, it's like a 30-second uh, interaction, but she shares this, right, with no affect, no emotion. I was forced into prostitution in the concentration camp. And then Fritz says, oh, my father was in a concentration camp for being a communist. And we know that historically Fritz Hanke's father, this is true, his father was a communist. So, you know, now we've got that little background of communism, class analysis, right? This is the lowest of the lowest classes. His final victim even says that she has um, blood in her stool and can't go to a doctor because she's got no insurance and no money. So, I mean, this is an underclass milieu study. That's, that's one thing uh, that it is. But in this little interaction between Fritz and, um, I have forgotten this woman's name, it might have been Frida, um, you see that, gee, they could sort of bond over this, maybe. You know, they both have this trauma in their background. Uh, Fritz himself was also briefly in a concentration camp for children. So, you know, if we want some explanation of how this dude got so screwed up, rotten family background, 
plus concentration camp, plus orphaned. I think we've got enough there. We just never get that criminal minds style. Um, oh, here's exactly what's going on. He yeah. has mother complex, you know, whatever. Because the movie really just wants to show us the brutality and the stupidity and the complete inability to actually form an emotional connection with anyone. This is a man who does not understand the difference between sex and love. As we see in that horrible scene where he's kind of made a friend with a woman and her husband at his new job. And they've just, um, I think, celebrated her birthday party and they're, they're drinking together. And he says, I love you, I wanna fuck you. And immediately he's all over her. This is not how normal relationships go, all right? I mean, there might, well, I don't know how your normal relationships go. By and large, it's not normal. By you swipe and right, large. they show up. <laughs> no, it, it's like, <laughs> if it's a sexual assault, there's usually not love involved. If there is love involved, it's generally consensual. Um, but for Fritz Honka, it's, I love you, I want to screw you, come on, put out, baby. And, and he literally assaults her, right? Tears her clothes off. Um, he does not know the difference between sex and love. Yeah. So a couple of things with that. Um, one was his background. I was on a little bit of research I did after watching the movie. I had seen that there was a scene of Sorry, that was meant to explain Fritz's background. Oh, we have a cat. Yeah, hey, kitty. That's for, say hello, Cecily. Now go away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Lucas. I um, didn't mean to interrupt you, but you know she didn't. Oh, do let's. It it, it's Cecily. She doesn't understand. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. So there was a scene that was cut. I had seen that was basically explaining that Fritz was uh, sexually assaulted when he was younger, uh -huh. and Fatih Akin opted to cut it because he didn't want to give a pass. Yep. To that kind of abuse. <laughs> Because there's Which totally I guess, no excuse for what this guy does, you know? And, and that, and this is coming back, as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Foles, my mentor, I took several classes into her. So I, obviously she's an expert on Fai Taikin. I've absorbed some of them. Um, and one thing that you see in a lot of his movies is a kind of drug trip scene. Yes. And I, I noticed something here, and I want to like posit this, and then we'll see where it goes. But I almost feel like this was an ant, kind of an antithesis of that. Insofar as after he gets hit with the bus, he swears off drinking. He's gonna swear off schnapps. He's gonna swear off the golden glove. He's not gonna do this, and for a bit, not got off long especially in terms of the runtime he is getting his shit together he has a job he's making friends things are going well there are scenes where he is actually actively refusing drinks people are trying to be like hey you can have a beer come on which especially in human culture is hard to say no to yeah. but he does and then when he starts drinking when he caves in that scene and like the control room or whatever with um helga it's very much that kind of switch back on it's that kind of he's back on his bullshit and we get kind of same not kind of we get the same old fritz yeah mm. yeah i think you're so it almost functions. so it's like in this movie the default setting is drunk out of his mind and the exception is the period of being sober. There is one scene though, that's a little bit like that signature uh, Fatih Akin drug trip, except it's not, well, I mean, everything in Fritz's life is alcohol fueled. It's when uh, Gerda has told him about her daughter, Rosie. And then he fantasizes about Rosie while they're having sex. And yes. in the most over the top, she's like in a butcher shop 
reminded me of Lady Gaga's meat dress, right? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So he takes this lovely blonde girl that he saw for all of 30 seconds, and he fantasizes her in a butcher shop, wearing the butcher's apron, with like raw meat on her lap, and chewing on a sausage. Sausages play a huge role in this movie. Yeah. And like I, I, I even had in my notes, I had meat, Colonel Pleasures, blonde oh, hair, yeah. big tits. Yes. Yep. And and it's like a it just it ticked all it's it's a very short sequence, but it's like that is his fantasy. And he's really only keeping Gerda around in order to hopefully get to the fantasy of the young, attractive woman who in real life, you know, we see over and over again at the bar that even these middle-aged, seen better days women are refusing drinks from him because he's so ugly. Mm. And he's clearly got this plot that Gerda's going to invite her daughter and then he'll have them trapped, you know, and he'll be able to have his way with Rosie. So... Yeah, that to me, that's the fantasy scene, is the Rosie, Rosie in the butcher shop scene. I can Ugh. see that, especially because it's just so brief. But like, I, I I had seen that segment, the sober segment is kind of like an antith, like I said, an antithesis to the usual like drug trip, getting high, getting stoned, whatever that Fat yeah. Keen is known for. Yeah, and I'm true. like, that is really weird, especially given this is a movie that, Given like what you said about Tia Keen and anybody who's seen this movie, this feels, correct me if I'm wrong, it feels very out of left field for him. I would not have expected Fatia Keen to do a true, basically a true crime biopic in a sense. Yep, I agree. You know, quasi horror. I mean, we can talk in a minute about whether it's horror or not. I would love to have that discussion. Right. Um, but it, it felt very, when I saw his name attached, my jaw dropped. I had very much the same reaction. And I, I don't think that his fans were necessarily pleased with this. Um, although I have to say, I'm an exception. And the, the reason this film came about is this, all this stuff happened in his neighborhood in Hamburg. Mm -hmm. right? Um, the Golden Glove is in the red light district of Hamburg. So, you know, like I said, it's a Hamburg movie. And in that sense, it is on brand for Fatih Akin, because if you think about like, okay. you men you'd mentioned Soul Kitchen, that's also shot in Hamburg. And mm -hmm. so as I understand it, he's also friends with Heinz Strunk. Um, he knows the guy at the Golden Glove, and it seems as though it's a movie that came about just because he knew enough of the right people that it turned out that, okay, I guess I'll do this movie. Um, and to me, what I got out of it in terms of my interest in Fatih Akin was simply looking at what, what I see as a strong Fassbinder influence um, in terms of the staging, in terms of the um, underclass milieu, which reminds me a lot of Ali Firi's The Soul. But I mean, this movie makes Ali Firi's The Soul look like some sort of paradise, you know? And if you watch that movie, uh, Ali Firi's The Soul, Emmy is a cleaning lady. You know, she's, she's widowed. Her kids don't give a rat's ass about her except when they need her to babysit. Ali is a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So these are two people who have been forgotten by society. Their lives are like seriously not glamorous. And um, it's a very pessimistic movie. But by comparison, it, that life looks really good compared to uh, this guy, right? But I do, I, I see a strong influence there. And I think that's, I think I'll be writing about this, Lucas. I really have to thank you for putting nice. this film um, because I had resisted watching it because of the reviews, because I don't really like horror. And when I watched it from that first scene, it had me because I, it, I, I just was watching it from the point of view of the filmmaking and it's beautiful. 
I mean, what's portrayed is horrible and ugly and gross and, you know, very much not family fun night. But the <laughs> filmmaking, um, the filmmaking is just so much fun. I mean, I love all the characters in the bar, right? And I love the scene with, um, I, I'm going to forget the names now because I can't access my notes, but this penultimate victim, the larger woman who was in the concentration camp, you know, he beats her bloody basically because she laughs at him during sex, right? He's having trouble performing. She, you know, having been a prostitute, we don't really know whether she still is, but she's she's got quite a lot of experience. And so she's giving this almost motherly laugh like, oh, come on, kiddo, we'll, we'll, I'll help you get it up. You know, we'll make it work. Let's get, like, let's get through this together kind of thing. Yeah, and he is so... You know, you, you can totally see how his mind is working. It's like he's sex crazed, but has performance issues. And if a woman point, either refuses him or points out that not everything's working the way it should. Oh, by the way, the real guy, another thing he had was he loved to bring home women with no teeth so that they could give him oral because he had this thing about being mutilated during oral sex. I saw that. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, there's a scene in which the woman with the false teeth is doing it with her teeth in. And at that point, he beats her up, kicks her out, breaks her dentures in the process, right? I mean, it's just, it's so creepy. But this penultimate victim, what I love about her is the next morning after he's beaten her bloody, she gets up, she goes to the fridge, gets a sausage, right? Our sausage thematics. Of course, every good German refrigerator has some sausage. And then she <laughs> goes for a jar of some type of condiment. Now my it was like mustard thought, or something, I think. Well, my first thought was mustard. And that is what I would expect a German to put on a uh, sausage. She doesn't put it on her sausage. She puts it, he puts it on his it. sausage. <laughs> I was wondering what she was doing because I heard him like scream all of a sudden. I'm like, what did I miss? Okay. And at that point I thought, oh, maybe that wasn't mustard. Maybe it was horseradish. Oh. Also Ooh. a common thing to have in a German refrigerator, right? Now mm -hmm. I always bought it in a tube, not in a jar, but I've got a jar of horseradish in my own refrigerator right now. Um, and that stuff burns. So I can imagine that having, you know, looked like a quarter cup, half a cup uh, amount of that smeared across your genitals. I know that would be painful for female genitals. I, you know, not quite sure how it would feel for a guy, but based on his reaction, not good. Right? It's like but an advanced interrogation I'm, technique. Seriously. It's, it's like... Uh. I was so cheering for her because after he, you know, her face is streaming blood. I'm watching the scene and I'm thinking, would you please wash your face before you start eating stuff? You know, I just, I really wanted her to wash her face. She wasn't doing it. She gets her food. She takes her friendship. She then kicks him. And I'm thinking. Kicks him in the dick. Yes. Go, right. You know, go woman. Um, and then of course he takes his revenge, right? And this is the most extended, most brutal murder scene. Right? Oh. First of all, he strangles her from behind. It takes a long time. So like if you're into this... watching this kind of stuff and it's not cut, right? I believe it's-, it's... Yeah, that was the thing is it, it was one- Continuous take. One take and that's yes. what- it's like way more stark and realistic. Like it's not, it's not, this movie isn't cinematic at all. I think that's why it works. It's got no cinematic quality. There's no, you know, creative crafty shots. It's all very stark and just there. And like you said, alienating. And that yeah. was a big yes. part of that scene. But that in itself is the technique, right? Because I'm going to contradict you there now for a minute. Remember now after he strangled her, he goes over to grab a drink and then, oh shit, she's still breathing. Got to kill her again. What a pain in the ass, right? I mean, you can literally see him thinking this. And he goes over and he hits her with bottle after bottle. Fatia can't that, oh. this from the victim's perspective, right? So it's, it's not, uh, you know, 
a take from somewhere farther away in the room. It's a take from below. And what we see on the screen is his angry face, you know, his ugly, angry face. He's got like the the grimacing of I hate you. And as as he breaks bottle after bottle after bottle over her head. And to It kinda me- looks like he had to take a shit. I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> uh, I I mean it's just the most gross <laughs> ugly distorted face and to me this is this is a really artful shot actually because he's giving us the victim perspective now she's probably you know unconscious by this point she's not actually seeing this the filmmaker is letting us see what the victim would have seen and we are in her shoes for that brief moment it's the only time in the film that he does that and I, I think it's, um, I, I think it's just awesome, as filmmaking, right? Not awesome as. Oh, absolutely. I would like to experience this, right? You don't ever want to see somebody looking that angry. Uh, the uh, only thing that uh, got with that scene is like when, during the the struggle, the simulation, which took. Not that I expected it to be quick, but it was such an ungodly long time, and as we said, it's that single that one take one shot and it was just i literally had in my notes all caps how do the neighbors not hear all of this yeah well, it's kind of like a slumming because i mean she's kicking around she's screaming she's breaking shit you know they hit the cabinet and shit goes flying like like how does no one hear this or everybody <laughs> like oh, somebody uh, pointed uh, this out to, somebody pointed this out to me lucas that's actually like a issue of privilege if you think about neighbors not reporting stuff like that you're thinking it from the privileged perspective of you live in an area where you would do something like that like right. if you live in like a very slummy area where you're probably around dangerous people a lot you just kind of get used to that and that's the way of life and you're not going to report it because you know they're going to know where that's coming from Right. And you don't want to call the cops. And, you know, now if we think about it, the the people who would hear this would be those Greek neighbors. Right. Yeah. And the Greek neighbors, it, it, it's such a funny, it's just a little detail, but we get that foreigner perspective in the film. Um, and it's real. Right. And so why would the Greek neighbors not call the cops in the 70s? Is everybody in that uh, apartment documented? I mean, the one scene where we see like the big family dinner. Now, I don't know whether they're all living there or whether they've come to visit, but it looks like at least a dozen people in what can Mm -hmm. be a very big apartment. So if these folks call the cops, are they themselves going to get deported or... um, reported for having too many people living in the space because this was a thing that actually went on in germany in the 70s i mean this was the height of the guest worker era and 74 75 if we think about it historically this was right after the anwerbestopp okay I'm sorry to throw out the german term there but um you guys are too young to remember the oil crisis of the 70s the worldwide recession that it caused and one of the effects of that in germany was that the germans stopped recruiting foreigners for their workforce because suddenly for the first time really for the first time in post-war germany there was now unemployment and so foreigners became increasingly unpopular uh, it was it was a lot the way that some people see foreigners here in the u.s oh all those illegals taking my job they took her germs right that was yeah that was pretty much the attitude and so all of this would give that greek family huge impetus to try and handle it on their own and not involve the police. And so when do the police finally show up and discover any of this? It's when there's a fire. And apparently, and it's actually sort of funny in a way, because Fritz is constantly blaming the smells on the Greek cooking. What causes the <laughs> and it fire? Was the stove. The Greek cooking, right? <laughs> but not the I, stove. I even had in my notes, I, I, I even had in my notes right, like, the family dinner i'm like so the greeks might be his undoing and then of course the maggot and i'm like oh god is this it no is that what that was i couldn't tell what was leaking from the ceiling it was maggots 
I, that, from that, the that makes sense. <laughs> I thought it was water at first. I was like, why would she scream from yeah, water? Yeah, no, right one now? like flicking girl's soup or whatever dish she had. Yeah. Another one, and they kept coming, and I was like, so you it, think it's one of those just oh my gosh ew 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 well with how many like, body parts he had in the yeah um, oh my gosh and then the in where he threw all, all the little tree deodorizers in with the body parts i i thought that was frankly hilarious it was, I mean, it was it's such a childish thing to do too because like he made the mess he just pushed it under the rug so to speak and thinking he's never gonna have to deal with it, he was covering up the way every way he could and blame on somebody right. else. Right. This guy was a, definitely a child inside at some yeah. level. Yes, absolutely. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, you really think that a couple of stupid tree deodorizers <laughs> are gonna cover this smell? Like you idiot. <laughs> and but but that's really that to me is what makes this film both really disturbing and hard to watch, but also maybe a necessary antidote to the usual portrayal of serial killers. You know, we are so used to seeing the mastermind with a master plan and, you know, some deep, you know, they're, they're intelligent, they're capable of dialogue, they're playing the police. No, this guy is emotionally stunted, uh, probably intellectually stunted, cannot help himself in the world the only thing he can think of to do is to take advantage of these women and kill them when things don't go his way i mean it's there is nothing interesting about this and that's the realism that i think maybe we need so that people don't glamorize um people like charles manson right? well, like what i was thinking is like this is a movie that were brit I almost want to see a version of the story by an American director. In so far as I want, I don't want to, I'm curious about how it would look. Yeah. Especially with that glamorization of violence we've had, especially in the 70s. He, they had Fritz Honka, here we had Jesus Christ take a pick of serial murderers. Yeah. yeah. Friendly true. reminder that Ted Bundy was Republican. Anyway. Right. But I. <laughs> I think if this had been an American film, we would have seen the police side of it. Yes. We would have had like some kind of scene at the police station uh, as they're identifying that first victim. And then, you know, we might have had maybe one or another of the later victims. Somebody might have reported them missing. And, you know, we could have, I don't know. I, it's. Yeah, and there might have been more psych. What is the noun I want here? Psychologization, psychologizing. Sort right? kind of manip almost manipulation of. Yeah, I think it. I think they definitely would have included that childhood assault scene because we're so hungry for explanations, right? We want to know why. Leave no serial killer unexplained, right? And I kind of like it better without the emphasis on the explanation because it it simply lets you see oh my gosh this was really a mindless pointless idiotic series of killings um, with no excuse and really no interest and if somebody does find this movie interesting like if they find that character interesting i would worry about that person you know <laughs> Like cinematic, like movie wise, it's an interesting movie the way it's presented, but yeah, the character is just, it was hard to watch some of this. Yeah. yeah. It kind of reminds me too, like in real life, serial killers are never very intelligent people. They're portrayed that way in the retelling of their story. Like the Zodiac was not a super intelligent mastermind. He got lucky a lot. And uh, the, uh, the Golden Gate Killer, he was smart in some ways, but he also messed up a lot. Like he left behind clues later when they got like DNA evidence. That's how they caught him was he left behind so, so much evidence. Yeah. Like, and I just love the fact that in this one, there's no, there is no police work. It's right. dumb luck, right? There's a fire and they, um, the only reason they discover the body parts is that one of the firemen gets sent up to the attic to make sure that there's nothing still burning. 
And of course, you imagine that that little door has probably been burned away, revealing the body parts. It's dumb luck. It's total dumb luck. So I'm really grateful that you put me on to this, Lucas, because this was this is one of those things on my list of, I really ought to watch it because it's a Fatih Akin movie, but I really don't want to watch it because it's such a grisly, um, so, so is it a horror film? What do you think? You guys are really the aficionados on that. Because I do not Case watch you go the ahead. genre. Wait, I just, the... I don't watch the genre. I wouldn't have thought it was a horror film, but I saw it, it was on Shudder and they usually only have horror films. So it's slated that way. But the way I see horror as a genre is presenting something in a safe, if not gross or terrifying or un unnerving kind of way that's horror is a presentation yeah. here it's more like you know this is straight fact like this is how stuff would look we're going to show it to you in kind of a safe way but you're not going to like this you will not enjoy this right. it's a horror a, a horror movie should be enjoyable this wasn't enjoyable right and there's very little of that suspense of the like don't go into that room um, with one exception, yelling kind of moments that a lot of, or yelling at the screen if you're in a theater, that right. a lot of horror has. Right. With one exception, the one place where I think this movie actually does that is with the Petra character. She's the lovely young blonde girl who has been held back a year. And so we get a little bit of foreshadowing. You know, when she's first introduced, she's being told, you can't continue to 11th grade. You have to repeat the 10th grade. And the teacher says to her, if you don't learn anything, you will be nothing. And I saw that and immediately I thought, oh no, is she gonna be end up, end up like as a prostitute working at the Golden Glove and she's gonna fall into Fritz's horrid little hands. And so you are led to expect this. And then in the last sequence of the film, she does show up at the club, not to work there, but with her friend, boyfriend, buddy, it's not quite clear, a guy who, by the way, is also an actor from a previous Fatih Akin film. So she's gone there with him, but I think he gets assaulted in the bathroom, sends her home. Yeah, the one guy pisses on him literally because looks like tries talking to him while they're doing their business and right. he gets angry with him, turn, you know, behind him and literally pisses all over his back. It was, oh. it was just. Yeah, I mean, it's just gratuitous, like, why do we need this, and why do we need to see this? But the boyfriend is, or, you know, the male character, he's so embarrassed that he's hiding out in the stall, and when she comes looking for him, he just says, go home, go home, and not very nice. So she's going home. Meanwhile, Fritz has an eye on her, and he's trailing her. And the whole time, I'm thinking, run, get on your bike, go faster. You know, that was the scene where it felt a little bit like a regular horror movie. Like, don't you see? He's right behind you. And then she's saved by the fire, right? Because they turn into that neighborhood and the house is already on fire. Well, clearly he can't like, you know, he could have assaulted her in a deserted street but he can't assault her with a crowd of spectators around, including firemen and police. And so that scene to me, um, you know, there are, she's one of the two women who get away in this film. And one of them is saved by the Salvation Army. And the other one is saved just by dumb luck, mm -hmm. by this fire. She wouldn't so, even know it either. Okay. Right. So there are a couple things I kind of want to take with that as far as horror. Mm hmm could we make a case, and I'm, I don't know how I feel about it, so I'm legitimately asking you guys, could we make a case for Petra as kind of a final girl by proxy? No. I mean, final girl is, it's different than just surviving. A final girl has to actively fight back, know the danger, otherwise it takes away the meaning of being the final girl, and it kind of does a disservice to the rest of them in the genre. Mm. As, like you said, it's dumb luck that she survives at all. Like, by all counts, she, I won't say should have been a victim, but was a, a likely victim. Yeah. And she probably wouldn't have fought back if he attacked tip. her. I think it's sort of a hat tip. And, you know, this is the one would have been victim that we don't have any evidence for, I don't think, 
You know, I don't think she's in the novel or the, you know, how would you know historically? Right. Sure. About the ones that got away. Although I will say, Lucas, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong a little bit because there was the gaze, which is an important part of the final girl in movies like Halloween, where you see the killer identify her and have that infatuation with her. And we have that immediately in the first act where he lights her cigarette, get that creepy smile. And yeah. she's in his head from that point on. She's so, part of a framing device for the movie, actually, because mm-hmm. she is the girl that he imagines as Rosie. And, you know, she's introduced rather early. And then she mm-hmm. shows up again in the final scene. And so she kind of gives structure to the movie. And also, you know, when you mentioned the whole proxy thing, he doesn't really want to be banging these, you know, refuse of society women. He would rather have somebody like Petra. She's just totally out of his league, right? And the only way he's ever going to get somebody like her is, um, you know, ambush, assault. She is not going to just follow him home the way these older women from the bar do. So, yeah, she, she gives an interesting structure to the film, I think. You know, I was thinking too, and maybe this is insensitive, but I feel like if there was like a dating app back then, that would have solved all of his problems. <laughs> he, would, he wouldn't have been a lonely man. There would have been somebody out there who would have found this guy very attractive. <laughs> there would have been at least one. Whoa, he would have been catfishing. Yeah, <laughs> that's really, really scary to think about. And as somebody who has spent my fair share of time on dating apps, <sighs> and um, gotten good at identifying the fake profiles he would definitely need a fake profile. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. He, he needs not, some heavy work. Oh, absolutely. He would not be putting his own picture on there. And there are two, not just one, but there are two sequences in the movie where he tries to offer a woman at the bar a drink. You know, the bartender goes over and says, hey, that guy wants to uh, spot you a drink. And the woman says, that one? Um, I think one woman says, I wouldn't even piss on him if he was on fire. Oh, I lost that one. I was like, oh, shit. And that, of course, is feeding into his hatred of women, right? I mean, this makes him feel justified in uh, the way that he treats the women, because as much as he's objectifying them, they're objectifying him. You know, when you talk about the gays, he is not an object of desire because of his appearance. He's only attractive to women who are so down and out that they're enticed by free liquor like the three women you know hey i got more of this at my house or um you know a meal a place to sleep he can only attract the the dregs of society did he Um, remind either of you of uh charles bukowski Like, not in the creative way, like, not in the artistic way, but in his personality. Because if you read his biographical works, he had a lot, in, like a lot more than you'd think in common with the killer in this movie. Like, he would always get women back to his apartment, usually the dregs of society, usually with promises and more liquor. And, you know, he would have his way with them while they were drunk. And that's when they would actually enjoy his company. Oh, my gosh. That seems, yeah, that's a, that's a good call. I have no idea whether Fatih Akin had that in mind, but maybe that's just a more common M.O. than we really want to admit. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, yeah. that's what I was going to say. You know, to quote, our, to quote the man who's still our president for, for 14 long days, sad. It's just sad. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag sad. It's Couldn't so even get laid with liquor. Hashtag sad. Yeah. Shameful. No. Basically. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so anything else that we want to uh, wrap up on with this flick? Did Lucas, either of you I... enjoy it? It's hard to say I enjoyed it. I enjoyed Define it in the same enjoy. way. Uh, I enjoyed it in the same way I enjoyed movies like Salo and Serbian film. I enjoyed knowing what they were i enjoyed the experience of getting through it but i'm never going to rewatch it mm-hmm. i'll probably rewatch it but only so that i can write about it right <laughs> you know not because yeah, it's this feels like a, 
this feels like a movie that there's a lot more meat on the bone. I think a lot more to appreciate from a <laughs> filmmaking perspective. What's that? I said, so to speak, meat on the bone. Sort of. Oh, shit. I wasn't even trying for that. <laughs> God damn it. You know I'm um, going to call you out. <laughs> I know. I know. But like there. I guess uh, even being familiar as I am with Atia King's work, I didn't quite know what to expect, especially with this being marketed. I mean, like I say, to some Joe Blow Shutter subscriber, not talking shit on Shutter here, it's very much. I don't know that this movie would stand out, and I feel. I don't know that it needs to. I'm not saying everybody should see this film, right. even. It's not a good but first I'm date just, film. Oh gosh, no! But no, it's not a date film at all. Are you kidding? <laughs> unless that's the one where the girl like grabs your arm in terror. It's, no. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, unless you're thinking that the date is going to end very, very badly. <laughs> if you want it to be the first and last date. Ooh. First, ew. yeah, first, last, and only. But like, but, you know, Lucas. Just speaking of this being a Fatih Akin film, there is one. Well, there's a lot of things, but there's one other thing that I'll point out that is very typical Fatih Akin, and that is the role that music plays in the film. The soundtrack to this film, until the very last song, which you guys probably wouldn't recognize, uh, but it's a, the very last song when the credits roll, is a German remake of, we had joy, we had fun, we had seasons in the sun. But the wine and the song and the seasons are all gone. I'll have to look it up. I'll look up the title of it. But I remember that tune from my youth. And so he, the soundtrack is composed entirely of cheesy 70s schlock. And I actually looked up one of the, the songs. There, there are two songs that play over and over. Um, one of them is like send me a tear or a, a little tear came on its way to me and um one of these songs that are like really really bad german pop music all of the women in the bar suddenly are crying all of them every last one that was such <laughs> a weird fucking scene i could not with that but to me that particular scene denotes the happiness that all of them have missed, right? And so I went to look up a little bit more about the songs, about the, the lyrics. And one of the things I came across was a review of the 1974 release of this song. And it's actually an Italian singer singing in German. And the review literally says, so-and-so, I don't remember the guy's name, but it says, yeah, he's a nice boy, unfortunately with no voice. So in other words, this was music that nobody even liked when it came out. And yet it's putting the characters into tears. And this tells you something about their taste level. I mean, it's just another sort of clever little way of showing that we are at the very, very bottom of society. These are not people who go to the opera or listen to Mozart. They're people who are um, moved to tears by like the worst music on the planet all right so we've covered a lot of ground here with this movie thank you so much dr l for thank you. coming on here talking shop with us this has been i think a little different episode if i mean the subject matter i think warranted that this was not i apologize if i'm watching this it's not a fun episode in, in most respects <laughs> I'll we'll make it fun. I, I will. I will say editorial life. I feel like I had to crowbar some of the humor in just so I didn't fucking cringe the entire time. Uh -huh. This was one that Chase and Chase and I were back and forth discussing it. Um, and I'm like, I'm 20 minutes in, and Jesus, I was like, this is depressing as shit. I needed, I needed a comedy after the. What did you watch after this? Because you told me that you watched a comedy after this. To I watched kinda, uh, a, a couple episodes cleanser. of. Couple episodes of Archer, which is kind of ironic because it's another guy who treats women terribly. <laughs> oh, dear. To like get over that distaste of having watched that for like an hour and a half. Yeah, 
For me, after I watched it, I was driven to just start researching it and find out more about the movie. Um, because again, you know, just based on the fact that I do know this director really well, I saw a lot of things in the film that I wanted to follow up on and, and check out. So thank you for um, forcing me to finally watch <laughs> this movie so that I would have something to say here tonight. I mean, I it was a movie I had wanted to check out because I knew the director and I'm like, who can I pull in on this? For better or worse, you're the one that came to mind. And I don't know that I could add a better guest on here for it. Well, so thanks. It was fun. Not the yeah, so for talking with you guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, if you're interested in checking the movie out, it is on Shutter and AMC Plus as of this recording. If that changes, that's on you, figure it out. Um figure it if out. you're interested in seeing it, it's the kind of thing. If you're going to watch it, you are only going to watch it once. And I just yeah. need you to so, trust me on that. If somebody's not on Shutter, I recommend renting it for two ninety nine from YouTube, which is mm -hmm. what I did. You can do that as well. Yeah. For Ch yes, for Chase Will, for Dr. Christy Bell, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for checking out Tease Family Fun Night. Hopefully the next one will be even more fun. But it is what it is. Watch something fun after this. This is, was a depressing ass movie. Oh so, yeah. Episode five hundred coming fun. next week. All right. Yes. Thanks. Have a good night. Next time.